Hi, today I'm going to be talking about an important idea that's related to Atlantis research and the study of Atlantis. This idea is called euhemerism. And euhemerism is the idea that the ancient, the gods of, of Greece and other, other cultures were actually kings and the royal families of those, of those cultures. And this idea isn't just limited to to uh, the Greek gods in particular, but it's been applied to other other deities and other pantheons and in, in cultures, including the Norse cultures and the Babylonians. And so this is a broader idea, but it relates to Atlantis in that um, a the one of the most important books that's ever been written about Atlantis, which was Ant Atlantis: The Antediluvian World, written by Ignatius Donnelly. He claimed that specifically. The Greek gods were the kings and royal family of Atlantis. And so I, I kind of went over the very basics of the history of Euhemerism, but to elaborate, <clears throat> these ideas really um, are named after a man named Euhemeris, who really is considered, who really put together all of these ideas that were uh, in the air at the time. And and really uh, assemble those ideas into a coherent and school of thought. But these ideas really preceded him, and and um, they they have been around in, in in the ancient Greece for a while before the fourth century BC when Euhemerus lived. And we can speculate maybe Socrates himself was a Euhemerus before you before the time of Euhemerus because Socrates lived in the fifth century BC, whereas Euhemerus lived in the fourth century BC. And so the idea was that Socrates he was actually accused by the Athenian people of impiety and disbelieving in Athens' traditional gods, introducing new gods and the corrupting of Ath Athenian youth. Well, the first of those charges, disbelieving in, in Athens' traditional gods, that would have been the Greek pantheon. And if he disbelieved in them, maybe he, maybe he had the belief that those Greek gods were actually men and actually ancient kings. And so... It, Socrates isn't directly accused of being a Euhemerist, and that word wouldn't have been used in the time. But, but it's possible to to that that he could have been one of uh, the followers. He could have been one of the people who anticipated the rise of this new um, new philosophy in ancient Greece. And that's just kind of speculation on my part. And actually. Um, Christians, both in the early Christian era and during the Middle Ages, were Euhemerists with respect to the Greek pantheon because, because Christians, they, their um, religion and the Christian religion originated from the Greco-Roman world. So, they would have been all early Christians and Christ and Christians in the Middle Ages would have been familiar with the Greek pantheon. It's not that it's just, it's not that those gods just suddenly. Were completely forgotten, but it, but the old faith was was really moved and transplanted into a new faith, and and so so Christianity actually denies the Greek pantheon, and many Christians, both in the early era and the Middle Ages, believe that the Greek pantheon was a were kings and rulers and queens of of some. Of Greece, presumably, because they are the Greek pantheon, it makes sense that they would probably be the kings of of the old old era. And this idea, as I said before, is not just limited to the the Greek pantheon, but it's also applied to the Norse gods. And in fact, the 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 author, the compiler of the most important compilation of Norse mythology to this very day, who is named Snorri Sturluson, he was from Iceland, he believed that the Norse gods were, were kings as well. So, so this idea of Euhemerism is, isn't just limited to the Greek pantheon. It's kind of a general concept that, that really applies to multiple different civilizations, multiple cultures, and is especially relevant for the time in which Christianity came to replace the pagan gods. The pagan gods were increasingly viewed as kings and queens of a past era. 
So the Greek gods and, and other pantheons were kings and queens, but that kind of begs the question of, of what civilization, culture, or people. Were, were these, were these uh, pantheons um, the, the rulers of a particular... If, if different cultures have a different uh, pantheon of gods, is there a pantheon that's unique for each of those cultures, or are those are those gods actually um, the gods of of a common civilization or a common people? That's that's a very important question, and it's not necessarily obvious which one is true, if any of them are. But here comes Ignatius Donnelly. Again, I made a video about Ignatius Donnelly, Donnelly um, the last video I made, which was featured on my site. And he basically made all of all 13 of these claims in his, in his book, which was published in 1882, and it was a bestseller, and is still in print, in fact. And all of these 13 claims are rather, rather uh, revolutionary, in fact. They are very... Um, they are they are very controversial to say the least. They were controversial then, and they are controversial even now. And so, one of the claims that he made let's let's just focus on one here because this is a this is a very long book that has a lot of different uh, ideas in it. Number six. Let's focus on number six. This is euhemerism Euhimer, in a nutshell. The idea that the gods and goddesses of ancient Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Hindus, and the Scandinavians were simply the kings, queens, and heroes of Atlantis. Now, this is really this is really important to understand that he wasn't saying that the gods of ancient Greece were ancient Greek kings. He wasn't saying that the ancient gods, the gods of the Phoenicians, were ancient Phoenician kings, or that the Hindu gods were ancient Hindu kings, or the Scandinavian gods were, were ancient Scandinavian kings. He's saying that all of those gods of all of these different cultures are kings of another separate civilization, of Atlantis. To me, that's the radical controversial claim. That, the, that each individual pantheon of each individual culture isn't the king's aren't the kings of that particular culture, but the kings and the queens of another civilization. That is the radical claim of, of Ignatius Donnelly that makes, him, that, that makes his claim different from the Euhemerists of old. Because the, the Euhemerists that preceded Ignatius Donnelly would have believed that each individual culture's gods were the kings of that specific culture, not necessarily this other culture, of, let alone a civilization that was destroyed 10,000 years ago. And again, this is the quote that's uh, shown in large. This is the number six of um, one of the... It's the sixth claim that was made by Ignatius Donnelly that was shown in the previous slide. <clears throat> but, the, but the idea of euhemerism, the idea that the Greek gods were the kings of Atlantis, is not necessarily an innovation of Ignatius Donnelly. And this idea did not really originate from him. If it did, we could really kind of accuse Donnelly of making this huge leap and a huge unwarranted leap in logic because that's a very, very extreme claim. But I'm arguing that this claim is actually supported by textual evidence and textual evidence that Donnelly himself did not really emphasize or cite. What is this textual evidence? We go back to the source called Diodorus. We, we go back to the source called the Library of History, written by Diodorus Siculus. The idea that Plato's dialogues are the only independent source of the Atlantis legend, I argued in a previous video, is false. 
And the reason why this one other source that I have discovered that has been known, it's not that I've discovered it, but it's that people have known about this for a, uh, for a very long time, but it's just been overlooked because the book only devotes around a few pages out of like 20,000 to 30,000 to the myth of Atlantis. So it's like this tiny little portion of the book. But the book, but that tiny portion still provides information that Plato's account does not mention at all. And so I argued in the other video that, that it's an independent source of the Atlantis myth. And these are some of the quotes from that, that source, Bibliotheca Historica, is the Latin, the Latin translation of the Library of History. And so the Atlanteans, at first it said that the, that the people believe that the gods were born among the Atlanteans. Now that's a very, that's a very general uh, claim. Let's, let's, let's go into the more specifics. Their, their first king was Uranus. And if you're familiar with Greek mythology, you'll know that Uranus is considered the, the most primordial of deities. He is the sky, considered the sky father. And, and if, if Uranus was a king of Atlantis, then by extension, because all of the other kings, of, because all the other so-called gods of, of the Greek pantheon were born from Uranus, as we'll see here, to Uranus was born 45 sons by Taitea. And because of the name of the mother, they were ultimately they were ultimately uh, received the name of the Titans. And so Diodorus is saying that the Titans, who are among the most important members of the Greek pantheon, were actually children of a king of Atlantis. So that means that the gods really did originate from Atlantis. And not only do the Titans originate from Atlantis, because Cronus and Atlas are said to be one of the Titans, and Zeus himself was a son of Cronus, that means that Zeus was a king of Atlantis. And so the idea that the Greek gods were, were the kings of Atlantis is not an idea that was introduced by Ignatius Donnelly. It's, it's an idea that's as old as... The, the the classical antiquity it dates back from the time of the late Greek era and the early Roman Empire, which is when Diodorus Siculus lived. And clearly, these ideas existed before they were written down. It's not like Diodorus himself what wrote down these ideas like a few years after those ideas just were 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 um existed. Those ideas must have been existing in a state of existence for a very long time beforehand. And so this idea that um, the Greek gods were the kings of Atlantis is a very, very, very important one that I wanted to talk about today because, because it, if the Greek gods really were the kings of Atlantis, then that then that actually increases the chances that Atlantis was a real civilization. Because you have all of these, because that, that means that the, that if the Greek gods really are the kings of, were the kings of Atlantis, then that proves for, for one, that, that the stories of those Greek gods and those Greek and the stories of the Greek gods, which are which are in Greek mythology, are history. And if if the story of the Greek myths, if Greek mythology as a whole is historical, then that implies that Atlantis itself is also history. And so that's why Euomerism is so important in the study of Atlantis, because it establishes a foundation for us to actually take the story of Atlantis seriously. And it not only 
And it allows us to not only take the knowledge that we have from Plato's dialogues in studying Atlantis, but it also allows us to use the entire body of Greek mythology, which is, which is incomparably greater in the number of myths and the number of stories than Plato's dialogues, which, which comprise only around 20 to 30 pages of written material, and also Diodorus' account, which is only around two or three pages of material. If we take the entire body of Greek mythology and use that to to learn about Atlantis, presuming that it's a that they are historical records of the time of Atlantis, then our chances of actually gaining a better insight of that civilization are dramatically increased compared to us just looking at Atlantis through the lens of these two or maybe three specific works that are explicitly about Atlantis.